remember, you know, what we said about the about the uh, um, about the, ab about the schedule. So, so, shall we be finished by let's let's say two p.m. or three p.m.? Yeah, uh, we initially planned the webinar to last for an hour, so okay. by two p.m. it should be done. Okay. By the way, Professor, it's nice to see you. Uh, apologies you. for for for. Uh, <laughs> We're hitting my camera, but um, Yuma and Rohan are going to be the moderators. Um, so yeah, good luck. Um, okay, well, thank you all for joining us at this event, uh, Online Arbiters of Truth. Uh, so this is run by the Institute for Internet and the Just Society's Digital Democracy Cycle. I'm Rohan Dronsfield, a researcher of the cycle, and I'm joined by my colleague Uma Kalkar, who co-leads the team. At the Institute, we pioneer an open platform that connects civic engagement with interdisciplinary research. And we focus on fair artificial intelligence, inclusive digital governance, and human rights law in digital spheres. We collaborate to find progressive solutions to the most pressing challenges of our digital society, bringing people together from all around the world and from across cultural backgrounds. The Institute empowers young people to use their creativity and intelligence to promote our cause and inspire others. Uh, just a note throughout this session, if you have any questions, please drop them in the chat and we'll circle back to these later on. We're delighted to have Professor Florent Giselle join us today to discuss social media regulation in the wake of the US Capitol riot. Uh, Professor Giselle is the co-director of the Digital Governance and Sovereignty Group at Sciences Po, a professor of private law at the University of Lorraine, and an associate researcher at the Institut des sur la justice. Her research focuses on private law from a comparative perspective and the issues that have been raised by the digital transition. Welcome, Professor Giselle. We're so excited to have you. Well, thank you for inviting me. I'm so uh, excited to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, great. Let's just dive right in. Um, you know, yesterday the world saw Joe Biden sworn in as the 46th president of the U.S. at Capitol Hill, which two weeks ago was the site of a riotous mob. And in the aftermath of the Capitol Hill insurrection, tech companies, including Twitter, Snapchat, Facebook, and many others, banned the outgoing U.S. president for spreading disinformation about the results of the 2020 elections and for inciting a riot. Now, this response of banning him has received praise and criticism, and Jack Dorsey, who's Twitter's CEO himself, noted that the ban on Trump was needed for public safety, but ultimately demonstrated a failure by Twitter to create healthy conversation. So my first question to you is, you know, does Twitter's ban set a dangerous precedent for removing other people and politicians from online platforms? Well, yes. Um, so I, I had a look actually at uh, Jack Dorsey's uh, 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 thread that he published on January 14th, so a few, a few days ago. Um, and as you said, he recalled the extraordinary circumstances under which the decision to suspend Trump's account uh, was made. Um, significant security concerns, uh, physical security, physical safety concerns, and, and even Darcy referred to uh, extraordinary and untenable circumstances. Uh, so this is a fact, but it is also a fact that he admitted that uh, having to ban an account um, like Trump's account is a failure for Twitter. It is a failure for Twitter. It is a failure to promote as he said, healthy conversation and sets a precedent. And, and he even said that he feels that this precedent is dangerous because it shows the powers, the power of individuals, but also the powers, the power of those big, very big platforms, those very big companies that are private actors. So he's perfectly right. Uh, in this respect, and it is not, and we, I think we would all agree that it is not for a private company like Twitter to intervene in the public debate. Um, and, and this is a very serious decision that was taken uh, um, regarding Trump. And of course, the fact that it is Twitter that took that decision um, creates discomfort uh, for obvious reasons. 
um, um, and yes, yes, I think it's true. It sets a precedent, but I wouldn't deal with it as something that is totally exceptional because this was coming. Um, th this was uh, something that is the result of, the, of a process that took years. And it's been years because this process has uh, uh, gradually taken place and, and um, we live online. We, we are accustomed to have part of our life that is online. And this is your reality. This is my reality. You know this expression? You probably know this expression of this Italian philosopher, Luciano Floridi. Maybe you know his name. Um, he, he, uh, he's the director of the Oxford Institute, uh, um, the Oxford Internet Institute. And he created this expression on life. Um, it's, it's a way to express the fact that today we live online and at the same time we live in the physical world and that there is no frontier actually. It's, it's exactly the same uh, world. But in this world there is this virtual space and in this virtual space you have those actors that have become the dominant players and they are able to make those kind of decisions. And of course, it makes uh, very, very uncomfortable because they don't have um, uh, the legitimacy to, to make those decisions. And I, I looked at you know, what J Jack Dorsey said um, to, um, you know, to provide for answers. And I'm not, I would say I'm, I'm not satisfied with what he said on his thread because, because you know, he, he does not propose any solution. He's aware of the power of the platform uh, the platforms have. He's aware of the fact that this uh, situation raises an issue, but then he doesn't propose um, much to remedy this situation. And, and I'm quoting here, if folks do not agree with our rules and enforcement, they can simply, simply go to another internet service. Um, but this is, this, is, this is not satisfactory. Um, users go to the biggest platforms because this is where they get um, uh, information, uh, be because this is where they get contacts. You know, all the, all the business model of these platforms is built on the network effect, which means that um, there is um, a form of capture. Users are captured. Um, you will not, of course, even if you, if you disagree with Darcy, um, even if you disagree with uh, Twitter's decision, will you stop going on Twitter? I doubt that. I doubt that. I think you will, you will continue to go on Twitter because you want to get access to this information that is on Twitter. Um, and then, so, so this is the first point. Second point, he, Darcy, promotes an open decentralized standard social media. And he refers to the Bitcoin uh, platform, um, which is a model of decentralization. And again, I, I don't see how this could work for social media. Um, it, would me it would mean that you would have a fully decentralized platform and that user would, would select, for example, the server or the website they want to access based on the terms of on conditions and or based on the on the algorithms that is in use on that server, for example. I don't believe it could work. I think it's not realistic. What I understand is that Dorsey doesn't want any regulation. So so he promotes this decentralized perspective. Um, as a, you know, as a counter argument, because he knows, obviously, he knows what it's coming and regulation is coming, obviously, even in the US, even in the US. Um, and my third point here about Jack Dorsey's tweets is the fact that um, he doesn't solve the issue of public persons of elected officials. Um, you know that there are very specific policies for um, elected officials, uh, what they call world leaders on Twitter. So they, they, you know, they started, of course, this new policy a few years ago, and they know that you have certain people um, um, whose um, uh, speech is of public interest. And it's, it's very true with Trump, because Trump 
as the president of the United States, uh, had um, um, uh, needed to be heard by American citizens. And this is actually the reason why um, a few um, uh, federal decisions in the US decided that Trump was not allowed to block American citizens because um, they have a right to access uh, their president's speech uh, and their president's uh, position. And this might work um, with other kinds of politicians, even though uh, they are not the elected officials, uh, even though they are not the president of the United States. And this is an issue because, because there is, you know, you have or my speech, your speech, you know, everyday life speech on Twitter, and then you have this very specific category of speech that is specifically newsworthy and, and more broadly speaking of public interest. And this should be addressed because this is also uh, something that is um, uh, um, fundamental in, the, in this decision. They didn't, you know, they didn't wait for January 20th to suspend this account. Uh, so at the time they did it, Trump um, still was the president of the United States. Definitely. And, you know, this really raises a, a higher question of like, you know, uh, while it's true that there are private companies that have the legal authority to block and ban people because, as you've mentioned, when you go on Twitter or any other platform, you're complying with their rules, their terms of service. But aren't these instances like uh, we've seen with what Trump has done and also what other people are using these platforms to do to spread misinformation. And the fact that at the end of the day, we're waiting for YouTube and Twitter and all of these groups themselves to take down information, really creating this dangerous reliance on corporate oversight on free speech. And moreover than that, kind of expanding on this question, you know, why are policymakers themselves so reluctant to do this work? Um, yes, this, this is this is a, a fundamental question. This is a fundamental issue. First, I would I would say that um, under American laws, they, uh, they are allowed to do what they do, what they did, at least Twitter, Twitter, Twitter has a right to suspend Trump's account. You couldn't uh, raise any uh, First Amendment argument in principle ag against against Twitter's decision because um, it is considered as a private platform that is authorized auto authorized to moderate content and the First Amendment can cannot be used against a private company. Uh, Twitter is allowed to manage its own architecture uh, according to an on the basis of uh, um, its uh, uh, terms um, of use. So, so um, yes, um, um, still we can agree um, that it is not for private actors, it is not for private companies to decide what, should, what can be said or what cannot be said online, uh, especially when it comes to uh, uh, public officials. Uh, and this leads us to, um, to a question that has been raised at the very, very beginning of the internet. Who should uh, set the rules of the game in this virtual world? Um, because, because this, as we said, this virtual world is an integral uh, a part of our lives. Uh, we are accustomed to the physical world and in the physical world, it is the state that sets the rules of the game. Um, but, but what about the virtual world? Um, in the virtual world, the presence of the state has always been uh, problematic uh, from the outset. Um, remember the very beginning of the internet. Um, the pioneers of the internet, they wanted to liberate internet users. Uh, they wanted to free them from uh, state control. And, and this was, you know, the, the internet was felt like uh, an emancipation, a, a, a possibility of emancip um, emancipation. Um, and and this, this, at the time, this, this looked um, 
um, I wouldn't say normal, but but totally acceptable and 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 um, in line with the fact that you don't have physical borders on the internet. So the network is transnational. So it's 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 very difficult for the states to intervene online, especially on, on transnational platforms. But what the pioneers of the internet didn't foresee, probably did not didn't foresee, is the emergence of these, these huge platforms. Um, because these huge, huge platforms, you remember probably the story of Amazon. Amazon was created in 1994, um, 1994, 1995. Nobody would have thought by then that Amazon would become this, this um, um, enormous platform with an overwhelming power like this. Um, and, and today, um, those platforms rely on network effects. They dominate um, the network, they dominate the internet, and they are the ones that uh, benefit from the, the liberation that was originally promised um, to internet users. So they are the ones that are in position to set the rules of the game. And this is what is um, problematic today, because we, in a way, got freed from the states, but now we have those platforms. And what should we do? What should we, should, should we ask the state to come back in the game and to rule, the, to, 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 to rule this virtual world and to uh, regulate those platforms? And this is a question now, because when you see, you know, when you look at uh, Jack Dorsey's um, uh, argument about decentralization, what he, his answer is no, we don't want the states. We want to keep up with the original ID. And the original ID is liberation, emancipation, um, decentralization. And, and I think this is what is at stake today. C can we save this original ID that the internet could free us from state from the state, but no from those very big platforms that are basically you know meant for for profit because in the end this is what they want they want profit they want power um but but you know if you have if i had to make a choice uh myself between those private actors and the state i think that i would choose the state <laughs> but we we could we could discuss this my my um you know I'm, I'm currently working on this i'm trying to 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 write something about this but my idea is that we could think of a form of democratization of internet platforms because they are private companies they have stockholders they have a ceo but maybe they are, you know we should think of their governance um and, and, you know, um, find other forms of governance that would include, for example, users. We could, let's say we could vote. We could vote on Facebook just to elect um, certain users that would represent us on, um, 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 uh, on the board, for example, on the, on the books, uh, Facebook's board. Something like this, and this is this might be an um, you know an element of the solution. So this is what I would say. We could, of course, think of regulation. I think that regulation is certainly necessary, and I think, of course, the states should be part of the game, and should and should make rules and and more rules. But at the same time, at SNIT, I, I don't think you know bringing the states in would be uh, the only solution to the issue uh, at stake. I think we also need to look at the way platforms are organized um, and try to think about their democratization. And this is some, somehow what Facebook um, started to do with um, the oversight board. Um, so this, this uh, initiative was criticized. Um, people said, okay, it's not independent enough. Facebook, you know, set up the, the um, the way the oversight board should um, should work, so this is not sufficient. But still, they they um, I think they understood something. We, we need uh, oversight 
uh, um, organizations, and probably they should be independent from the platform. Thank you for that. It's really interesting to hear your um, talk about liberation, freedom and emancipation, particularly at the, I guess, the beginning of more social, uh, larger social media is now. And so the initial ideas of these, these freedoms echo Jack Dorsey's sentiment of decentralization, but you're certainly right in that things have changed now. Power has massively been augmented in the hands of the social media companies. Um, one thing that I've found is that this trend is really illustrated by the debate on Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. Uh, so it was a landmark US law protecting social media companies from liability for content that they use as posts, and it's been contended since its conception. Uh, I guess debate has been, has been fiery for years on it, but it's been reignited recently, particularly in light of the US capital riots and the social media bans. Could you walk us through the Decency Act? Uh, you know, what is Section 230 and why are lawmakers talking about it in light of the riot? Um, yes, well, in this case, um, uh, well, in the case of the Section 230, I would like to highlight the fact that um, historically speaking, uh, the original purpose of this legislation was to restrict free speech. You, you might know the history of this Section 230. Um, originally, this, uh, this, this was an amendment, and this amendment was introduced in an attempt to uh, regulate uh, sexual material online. And you had a provision that made it illegal to um, knowingly send to or show minors obscene or indecent content online. Um, so it was a very broad language. And it raised uh, um, uh, protests. Uh, you had various lawsuits that were brought against this provision. And the Supreme Court um, uh, finally decided to strike down uh, the anti-decency uh, sections of, um, of th this regulation. So it is interesting to know the history. So no, today. Section, you know, you have two main aspects of this section 230. First, first, this section 230 says that um, uh, providers, internet providers, um, um, uh, shall be treated, uh, shall not be treated as publishers. They, um, they shouldn't be liable for, uh, for any um, content published by third parties. So they um, uh, cannot be legally responsible for what others say and do online. And so this is an, uh, an immunity. This is, this is something that allowed um, the, those big platforms to uh, develop. Uh, it's true for, for Facebook, for YouTube, for Amazon, they were not liable for anything. And, and, and they were capable to grow and to, and to grow fast. Um, but there is another abs, abs, uh, aspect of this section 230, which, um, which is more specific to uh, content moderation, because this provision states that um, 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 internet service providers, social medias, uh, social media, um, cannot be liable when they um, restrict access to material, uh, especially if this material is objectionable and especially if they do this in good faith, okay? So this enables company, uh, companies to uh, remove illicit content um, content that violates the uh, company's rules uh, without any fear of liability. Uh, so, so platforms are allowed to engage um, in good faith uh, community moderation and they do it, but, but you know, um, they have their own approach. Um, it's not an obligation for them to, um, to moderate content um, they are not liable for the content that is posted online. So, you know, they, they do 
as they want. But these two provisions uh, um, makes them very comfortable. They are free to do whatever they want. And this is the reason why so many people want to reform this, to probably to make them liable to a certain extent or uh, to regulate the way they moderate content. And you probably know that in the US, um, even though no one appears to be satisfied with this provision, you have different approaches because the um, conservatives say um, the platforms are, are biased. Um, um, they use moderation to uh, prevent us from, from, from speaking online. Um, so you had many, many lawsuits brought by, by conservatives conservatives, and this is something that Trump said himself. Um, Trump had created a task force in the White House um, uh, dealing with platforms uh, bias, uh, biases. So this is, this is the, conservative, the, the conservative approach. But on the um, uh, other hand, you have um, the liberals um, and especially the Democrats uh, that say no, but there is no, uh, there is not enough moderation online. Um, and what they want is more moderation. What they want is a real fight against uh, conspiracy, against fake news, against hate speech. So today it appears that no one is satisfied, but uh, people do not agree on what they want. And, and so today we know that this section will certainly be um, reformed. Uh, Trump, for example, was strongly against moderation. So he wanted to make the platforms that moderate content liable. He said, okay, as soon as you, you know, have a moderation policy, you're an editor. So you should be considered as an editor that is liable. Uh, for content. Uh, this is what Trump wanted. Okay, this will not happen. No, we have to see what Biden wants. It is not totally clear to me what he wants. At one point, he made, you know, a few statements um, saying, yes, we should um, um, reform Section 230. He even said one year ago, uh, Section 230 should be revoked. Um, but I think his focus is um, on moderating. It's the, it's the Democrats, it's a Democrats approach. Uh, so, so it's difficult to say now what can happen. Um, um, Americans are very much interested in what's currently going on in the, in the EU. Um, for example, the Digital Services Act is widely read uh, in the US right now, it's widely read, it is commented, it is criticized as well. Um, but you have certain American scholars that are strongly in favor of uh, reforming the uh, uh, federal legislation um, in the light of, of what the Europeans are currently doing. Uh, you have scholars that, for example, Daniel Citron, you might know her name, um, Daniel Seitron, she, she published various pieces saying, well, we could have an immunity that would be uh, conditional on the platform taking reasonable steps to prevent or to address unlawful uses of its services. Okay, so this, this is not that far from what we are currently doing in the EU, from, from even what we've been doing over the past 20 years in the EU. So, so maybe we could you know, find a solution that would satisfy everyone on both sides of the Atlantic. That, that, that would be a dream, I guess. Uh, it's this um, focus on good faith in, in 230 that's becoming more questionable alongside the power that we discussed earlier of social media companies. And I know a lot of people would find it questionable to say that individuals like Mark Zuckerberg are acting in good faith when they're moderating content. So should it be left up to these private actors? Um, let's pivot towards Europe for a moment. So building on your comments of the Digi uh, Digital Services Act and, the, and GDPR in general, 
Um, the DSA encompasses a set of new rules that aims to both create a safer digital space and establish a level playing field to encourage innovation and competitiveness in the digital sphere. Uh, how will the DSA tackle future unilateral decisions to ban public figures, such as the one undertaken by Twitter? And are we moving towards greater transparency and public accountability? Yes, well, for now, it's interesting because this, this uh, uh, Digital Services Act is not meant to change, um, um, to fully change the, the, the EU approach um, that was designed by the directive from 2000, uh, the e-commerce directive that you uh, probably know. And you know that in this e-commerce directive, there is a, a, a principle of a conditional liability exemption uh, for hosting providers. So um, if those providers do not have actual no knowledge of an illegal content or of, a, of an illegal activity online, they are not liable. Um, um, but, but they have the obligation to act expeditiously to uh, remove illegal content uh, as soon as they know about it. So so this is the principle in the EU, and this, this is not changed, this will not be reformed by the new uh, Digital Services Act. Um, and this, is, this will still be the legal basis um, of, of notice and takedown mechanisms uh, in, in EU countries. Um, but what will um, uh, change is the fact that uh, those moderation practice practices will be more regulated. And this is what is interesting because the, this Digital Services Act provides for a kind of due process, um, which means that, of course, everyone um, will have to be fully informed of the, of the moderation practices. The, the, the platforms will have to be more transparent about what they do. And, and we know that they are not transparent yet. We don't know how their algorithms work. Um, um, they change their, their policy. We never know about when they change them or how they change them. So they will have to be more transparent. But what is very, very important of, about this, this new due process is the fact that um, moderation decisions will have to be motivated and they will have to be subject to dispute. So, so platforms, you know, when, when the platforms uh, decide to take down a certain content, uh, the, the platform will have to communicate the reasons. Um, and then uh, it will be mandatory for the platform to um, uh, create a, a system for contesting decisions. A moderation decision. So when, when um, a decision is made to remove content, it will be possible for all users um, to contest the decision. And then, so there will be, of course, um, a, 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 request, a request made uh, to the platform, but then, then they will also have to offer uh, their users a possibility to bring their claims to uh, an alternative dispute resolution organization that will be certified and that will be neutral and independent. Um, like, for example, mediation, okay, online mediation, for example. And of course, if um, you do not find any agreement, any compromise, then you might go before a, a, a court. Um, um, but but this is this aspect to me is very important because it, it will oblige um, those platforms to be more transparent, um, to be more consistent, um, um, and and you will have a recourse. You know, I don't know if it occurred to you. I have people around around me that got their their accounts suspended. Um, they didn't find how. Um, they could contest the suspension. They tried to discuss with the platform. It didn't work out. So what did they do? They created another account with another name and another email address. This is what we are currently doing. Um, so, so this should change. We should have an official um, uh, way to uh, challenge those moderation decisions. Even, you know, if, if it's just uh, something like 
uh, a certain content that is removed. Um, uh, there was this, uh, in France, you know, something happened a few years ago. It was uh, this painting from Degas uh, that represents a naked woman. And, and this content was removed by Facebook. Um, well, by Facebook's algorithm. But in this case, of course, you should have the right to challenge the decision, of course. And so kind of building on that, you know, what's coming up a lot has been issues of trust and transparency. And I know that there have been past efforts you know, what comes to mind is the French uh, Avia law and also the German Netz DG uh, regulation attempt to kind of govern free speech. And uh, it was widely criticized, both of these instances, as being unconstitutional and an overreach by governments online. But then on the other hand, we've just seen, you know, the fallout that can occur from a, a Wild West online space in the US. And so the question that really now comes in this, what's next for online governance will really be, you know, can we trust social media and can we entrust them with this idea that they will build these platforms that are transparent and these rules that are open and straightforward that allow this, this kind of, you know, uh, discourse and recourse, as you've mentioned, while also keeping that balance between having a mitigation code, but also allowing people to express their feelings and have that, going back to that idea you had brought up before, have the space for liberation and emancipation of thought. Yes, well, um, one point just about, about this, because those laws that we have, or in France, we, 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 we never really adopted the, the Evia law. It was censored by the Constitutional Council, but, what we what we are currently doing in the EU and in on, especially in Germany or in France would be totally impossible in the US. And this is an important point here because you probably know that the first the first amendment protects um, uh, freedom of speech against any kind of legislation that would be adopted by Congress, and it it wouldn't be possible for. Um, um, for the federal Congress, but even for the states to adopt a legislation that would regulate on online content. So this is a paradox in the US right now, because, because basically private companies are doing what the state cannot do. Um, and, and so this is, so this is, you know, what my American colleagues tell me, but they, they tell me, but you should be, you know, Europeans. You, you have this possibility to regulate that we don't have in the US. And, and so this is the reason why in the US we have to trust those private actors because they are the only, one, uh, the only ones that can fight against uh, fake news, for example. So when we look at those laws that you mentioned, the German laws, the Avia laws that were censored, of course this is, or I would say it's, it's somehow our, our culture because we are very attached to the intervention of the state. Um, and, and we have no difficulty in, in thinking about uh, the possibility of um, a strict and even very strict uh, regulation of private actors. And I don't know if you had the occasion to look at the Digital Services Act, but also the Digital Markets Act. They are very, very tight regulations. They, it looks like, you know, those big platforms uh, will be um, uh, brought, uh, uh, will, be, will be controlled by the European Commission, uh, that the European Commission will look into everything. Um, um, and and some, in certain cases, even member states and member states authorities. So, so, um, um, I'm not that um, concerned about the fact that you have a close control um, um, of, of state and European authorities. Um, um, why? Well, because um, again, as I said previously, I would if I if I have to make a choice between trusting the state or trusting the platforms, I think I would still trust the state. Um, 
Um, and in, in the case of the Evia law, so, so you know that this, this law was um, highly uh, contested. There was, there was a very strong pushback against this law. This is a law that, that, that was not that far from the German law, actually. The principle was exactly the same. Um, uh, this law obliged platforms to remove uh, the most re reprehensible content within a very short period of time. And, and um, this law was censored by the Constitutional Council um, on the basis of the freedom of expression. Um, the main argument was that uh, this law, uh, this legislation obliged the platforms to assess themselves um, within a limited time um, to assess themselves the contents concerned, if those contents were uh, illegal, reprehensible or not. So it was for them to make the decision in a few hours. And people said, it's not for them to make those decisions. It's not for them to decide that a certain content is illegal. Um, and some fe feared that um, the platforms would be uh, overzealous, that they would remove a lot of content just to avoid sanctions. Um, I'm, not, I'm not that um, convinced by this argument. It is true, but at the same time, you know, the people who um, criticized this legislation said it is for a court of law to make the decision. It is for a judge to decide what is illegal and what should be removed. But, and, and my point is that, you know, it's, I don't think that the judicial system is equipped to deal with those issues, these moderation issues. Um, um, uh, I, of course, you should be allowed to bring your claim before a court at one, po at one point, of course. But, you know, on a regular basis, I think we should find a system that is more flexible um, um, because of course, um, and, and responsive, unresponsive, because when you have um, um, content um, um, like apology of violence, this must be removed within, within one hour, within two hours, because this, this is viral. Uh, this, this can, this, this can uh, um, be spread on the internet, on the world network and have disastrous effects. So I think we should, um, you know, have a system of checks and balances. We should trust the platforms to a certain extent because they are the best equipped to do this moderation work and, and no one else can do this for them uh, since they, they control the architecture. But at the same time, we should have an oversight. We should have, for example, uh, an, in, an independent uh, board, oversight board, for example, that should um, be involved in the most important decisions, like you know, suspending Trump's account. We should probably you know, um, have, yes, this system where you have an independent body uh, that would be involved in the most important decisions that could also uh, look at the, at the uh, uh, challenges, at the recourses brought by users. Um, uh, so this is what's, what Facebook started to do. But we should improve, probably. We should improve this mechanism. Um, uh, so so this, is, this is actually my, you know, what, what would be my, my point, my perspective. Um, I, I'm, I don't know if this would be feasible in the US, you know, having an independent body involved in the process, except, you know, if the platforms agree on this, this would work. But I, I don't think that in the US it would be possible to impose such a system to platforms. Um, and this is not, you know, this is not something that I read right now that I can see um, on, on, in, in scholarship, in the American scholarship. They, people talk about regulating, people, people look at the Digital Services Act. Um, of course, you have people that are very much, very much against um, a new regulation. You have some people that say that. You have some people that think 
that it would be possible to, de to deal with those issues with only um, uh, antitrust, uh, saying, okay, th this, this problem exists because um, those platforms are, are too powerful, so we, we should restore competition and, and then, you know, users would make their choice. So you, this is something that you can find in the US scholarship right now, but I don't see any contribution saying, yes, there should be an oversight. There should be a third party involved in the process, probably because the Americans are um, very sensitive to uh, the respect of private property. And, and the platform's architecture is their property. So they are considered as, free to do whatever they want on their property. This is how I understand it. No, definitely. And I mean, I think this is really important to bring up this, the, the you know, cultural and legal differences between these areas. And as uh, a lot of the, 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 the news that has come out of the past few weeks has been, you know, what can the US learn from Europe and how can we adapt um, but really, it's it's more of a systemic historical issue that we have to address first if you want to have any change in how the Americans govern online spaces. And so really kind of taking that and just scaling up uh, in this final question before we go into our Q&A, looking at the international atmosphere, and I'm really thinking about China's case study uh, as compared to both the US and the EU, how can different legal traditions and understandings of free speech and censorship and all of that influence this now growing debate on how we govern social media? Yeah, well, this is a, you know, you, 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 this is the hardest, the pro probably the hardest question that you, you've asked me so far. Um, it's, a, it's a very complicated issue. I, I, I couldn't provide for a solution. I, I think it, it's, it is, of course, necessary to discuss that. I saw, for example, that uh, a few days ago, Thierry Breton, who is the EU commissioner, uh, said, OK, I'm ready to discuss with Joe Biden, uh, with the Biden administration, about those uh, uh, social media issue. Because, of course, at one point, we, ne we need an agreement on an international basis. Um, you mentioned China, but you have uh, other countries. Um, um, in certain countries, you know, you, you have uh, people who would say that social media are the way for people to be m more free uh, to express themselves while the state is an authoritarian state. Um, so, so you, of course, in certain countries, the situation is totally different. Uh, from what we know, we, we live in, in, in democracies. Um, so yes, and this is probably the, the most difficult question at the time. Um, and and I, I'm not, for now, I'm not capable of providing any, any solution to this, except that, yes, this, this is open to discussion. And, and, and maybe we, we could find a certain way to, to put everyone on the table, okay? But, when you when you mentioned China, um, China is playing uh, its own game uh, um, and and trying to to you know to have its own internet actually and you know that there are much discussions about the architecture itself the, the internet ar architecture itself because because China but Rus Russia as well they want to gain control over the architecture so all those issues are. Um, uh, very close to to um, to each other, and and I unfortunately I don't have the final um, answer to this. Uh, yeah, I think we certainly gave you a tough question to to end that off there. Uh, but thank you very much, Professor Giselle, for an interesting and productive discussion. Really sped past, and uh, I think we'll just take a couple questions from the audience before we finish up. Um, so we're not saying names because of GDPR, I guess it's quite uh, relevant. Uh, so firstly, um, do you think that the government officials such as President Trump should have a higher degree of freedom when it comes to what they can say online than regular people? Yeah, I Positive, do. I yeah, yeah, I do. And I, I, you know, this is, this is what 
um, uh, uh, Twitter organized and Facebook as well, because in, in everyone feels that there should be a very specific uh, regime, a very specific um, um, scheme when, when it comes to public officials. Um, and so, but, but again, um, is it for the platforms to design um, uh, those very specific rules? I'm not that sure. I'm not that sure. And again, this is, this is a discussion that we should, we should probably have on an international basis. Because, uh, for example, I remember that at one point, Twitter, Twitter decided to remove certain tweets from the Brazilian president, Bolsonaro. And so, so he, you know, Twitter doesn't have the same approach um, depending on the, um, on, the, on the officials that is uh, concerned. And here we should, we should certainly have a more uh, consistency on those, uh, on those content moderation uh, decisions, especially when you have um, elected officials um, uh, concerned by the decision. Definitely. And another question that we just received that's very interesting is the price of disinformation. How much does disinformation cost and how much money do you think uh, fines from the Digital Service Act in people who are violating regulations would account for? Um, I, I'm I, I, I'm not sure that I got the, the very last uh, the very last part of your question, uh, but I understand that you're asking me about the cost of of fake news. Uh, is is it, am I correct? Yes. So this this uh, this attendee is asking how much would did would the would disinformation cost and how much really does the Digital Services Act kind of stand to gain financially? from people or companies really that are breaking these rules and then facing fines. Yes, you don't I don't have I don't have the numbers in mind but you you know if you breach those provisions that are stated in the Digital Services Act or in the Digital Markets Act you you might be fined um, and the, the amounts could be very very significant. You know no no it's not um, it's, it's this is very, this is becoming very serious. This is becoming very serious, and this it is the only way um, to make platform uh, take action because they didn't have uh, for over the past years um, they didn't have any incentive to take action. Remember what happened with Facebook, um, even with with Twitter actually, because they all uh, accepted uh, political advertisements for for years. Uh, they made an enormous profit with political advertisement and they make profit with polarization uh, because this uh, polarization attracts users and the more users they have the more they sell ads and the more they, they make money so of course um, uh, if there's no cost for them attached to fake news um, uh, to illegal content there is no incentive for them to take action so of course, if they are fined, um, and and remember the, the German the German legislation also provides for uh, sanctions um, uh, that can go, but I if I recall well, um, up to twenty five million euros, uh, twenty five million euros. Um, but so of course you need you need that. Um, if the question is more global about the cost of um, fake news or the cost of illegal content, I could say that it's, it's controversial. Um, for example, if you look at uh, the elections, the past elections, so we don't have enough you know, uh, um, uh, data regarding the very last American election, but you have people that made uh, conducted studies about the past American elections, even about the Brexit. Um, and, and the conclusion was um, that, you know, the impact um, of fake news, uh, of, of uh, conspiracy uh, theories um, on the election was not that important. But, but again, you have various studies and they contradict 
uh, each other. So, so I couldn't, you know, ha reach a final conclusion about this. But, but there is controversy about this. Um, I think what we can we what we can agree on is the fact that, of course, um, um, it it is needed to um, um, provide for significant fines to make sure that the, the worst contents are removed. Um, uh, because uh, it's, it's in any case a, a, a very bad thing uh, for society as a whole and for uh, our democratic life to have so uh, many fake news online, for example. It was lovely, thank you. Um, so I guess the last question to wrap up, and it was a, a good sort of holistic basis of what we've been talking about. Um, do you have any thoughts on where the line should go between state censorship and state regulation? And should states be brought uh, in more to restrict um, social media companies? Um, I'm, I'm not sure that I totally get the distinction between state censorship and state regulation. Uh, of course, there, there are various ways to, um, to deal with this issue when, when uh, um, um, you take action, when you adopt a regulation. Um, you have a possibility to adopt provisions that say expressly and, and, and very precisely that a certain content is not allowed online. And then it's a direct obligation for the platforms to remove this content. And this is the end of the story. And then you have another way to deal with it, which is, for example, to um, uh, rely on, on, on another authority. Like in France, for example, we are um, uh, thinking of um, um, giving more power to what we call the Conseil Supérieur de l'Audiovisuel, um, uh, the CSA, and which is, a, which is a council and that would be in charge of um, a, a certain kind of oversight. So this is not censorship as such. It's a kind of, of it's a way of um, um, regulating the platforms by creating a form of oversight. So of course, um, I think it is probably the best way to deal with this kind of issues, relying always on an independent uh, authority that has the flexibility. And again, I'm, 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 I can again give the example of the. Um, uh, of the of the avia law of the, uh, the this law that was that was um, challenged on the basis that we should always ask a judge to make a decision. Um, um, I, I'm not totally convinced against by this by this perspective by this argument because I think um, it's it's we we should have more more flexible more responsive. Um, um, entities that would be in charge of this kind of oversight and that would be that would have to deal with the with, with to discuss with platforms and to work with them to collaborate with them. Definitely. And, you know, I think that this has opened up a greater conversation that unfortunately we're running out of time today to go over. I mean, as you said before, we could talk about this for hours. Um, but I would just like to close off this session with first a huge thank you to you, Professor Giselle, for joining us today. Um, you can keep up with Professor Giselle at Flo Giselle on Twitter. She's still got an account there. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> yeah, for, for the time being, fingers crossed. Um, and of course, you know, thank you all to our wonderful guests for joining the session today. And don't forget to tune in to next week's panel discussion on online content moderation and the freedom of expression that will be hosted by the Institute's Digital Constitutionalism Cycle. Save the date, January 26th, Tuesday um, at 1 p.m. CET. And also, Please feel free to follow us at the internetjustsociety.org and keep up with us about the most pressing issues in digital society. And as was mentioned previously, you can catch the recording of this session on Facebook as well. And once again, just a huge thank you for all of you who came and joined us today and looking forward for more insightful and thought-provoking thought, thought conversation like we've just had. 
Um, thank you all. <laughs> thank you.